One of the biggest things that my weight loss clients struggle with is not seeing the scales move when they feel like they're doing everything right. So in this video, I'm gonna take you through the 20, yes, 20 reasons why you're not losing weight, even if you're on a diet and exercising regularly. And then I'm gonna tell you how you can overcome them so you can lose weight faster and easier. And most importantly, have the peace of mind that what you're doing is actually working. In case you're wondering who I am, my name's Doug and I've been a personal trainer and a nutritionist for over five years. And I specialize in helping men to lose weight, burn belly fat and build muscle so that they can double their energy, strength and confidence. Okay, let's go. Reason number one is that you're not actually in a calorie deficit. So maybe you think you're in a deficit, but you're not actually in a deficit, or maybe you've never even heard of a calorie deficit. So a calorie deficit is what you need to be in to lose body fat. This is where you are burning more calories than you are consuming. To know whether you're in a calorie deficit or not, you need to understand what your maintenance calorie number is. Your maintenance calorie number is the number of calories that you'd want to consume if you just wanted to stay the same. And we can do this with a very simple calculation. You take your body weight in pounds, not in kilos, in pounds, and multiply it by 15. If you're a moderately active person, that equation is going to work well for you. If you're relatively sedentary, I would take your body weight in pounds and multiply it by 14. So now you know your maintenance calorie number, what we want to do is create a deficit where you are consuming fewer calories than that. A lot of people like to try and stick to a 500 calorie deficit because this adds up to them losing one pound off body fat per week. The maths behind this is that there are 3,500 calories in one pound of fat, which means that if you adhere to a 500 calorie deficit per day for seven days, 500 times by seven, you're gonna create a 3,500 calorie deficit. So you're gonna lose one pound of fat per week. But you don't have to stick to a 500 calorie deficit. You could go smaller, or if you really wanted to, you could go even bigger. So if you've not heard of calorie deficits, that is the underlying principle that sits above all of the dieting methods. So whether that's vegan, carnivore, paleo, keto, intermittent fasting, whatever it might be. Those are all methods that sit underneath the principle of creating a calorie deficit. If you did already know what a calorie deficit was and you think you're in a calorie deficit but your weight isn't going down and you've been doing it for, let's say, over four weeks, sorry to say this, but you're not in a deficit. A lot of people will underestimate how much they're eating or more likely they'll overestimate how much they're moving, how many calories they're expending. Now it is pretty difficult to calculate how many calories you're actually expending. So it's always better to underplay that number a little bit. When it comes to how many calories you're actually consuming, the simplest way to know this accurately is to track your calories using an app like MyFitnessPal. And if you already know what a calorie deficit is and you're tracking your calories and you've been in a deficit but you're still not losing weight after four weeks, then it's probably one of the other 19 reasons. Reason number two is your macronutrient split. You see, one of the biggest lessons that I want you to take from this video is that there's a big difference between losing weight and losing fat. Losing fat comes from creating that calorie deficit like we just spoke about. Losing weight comes from a whole host of factors. But really, it's far more important to focus on losing the fat rather than the weight. And one of the biggest reasons that you might not be losing weight, even if you're in a calorie deficit, is your macronutrient split, specifically if you are having a high carbohydrate diet. Now I wanna say straight away, a high carbohydrate diet is not a bad thing. In fact, I encourage most of my clients to have between 40 to 60% of their calories coming from carbohydrates. They are our body's preferred source of fuel. If you overly restrict your carbohydrates, you're going to feel terrible. You're not actually going to have the energy to do anything. It's going to knock your hormones way out of balance. Your sleep's going to get disrupted. And ultimately, you're going to find it a lot harder to stick to that calorie deficit. A high carbohydrate diet where you fuel your body properly is going to enable you to get up and to do things. It's going to give you energy. More importantly, it's going to give you drive. But saying that, if you are on a high carbohydrate diet, or even if you're on a moderate carbohydrate diet, but you've had a high carbohydrate meal, you will probably find that your body weight fluctuates and plateaus a lot more. And the reason being is that carbohydrates are broken down into glucose. Glucose is a simple sugar that our body uses as fuel, a little bit like how a car uses petrol. However, our bodies are very clever. And if it doesn't need the glucose here and now, it will store it as something called glycogen. The thing about glycogen is that it bonds with water and it can bond with a lot of water. For every one gram of glycogen you store, that can bond with three grams of water. And you can hold on to a lot of glycogen. The amount of glycogen that you can hold on to is relative to your existing body weight. So if you're already on the bigger side, you can hold on to more glycogen. And that means you can hold on to even more water. So don't be disheartened if you're not seeing the scales go down, particularly after a high carbohydrate meal. You also don't need to associate any weight gain after a high carb meal 
as fat gain because all you're doing is gaining a little bit of water weight and that's coming from the increased glycogen which is bonding with that water which you're now storing if you have had a high carbohydrate meal i would encourage you to use that excess energy that you've got the next day because the chances are you're going to feel a little bit more restless you're going to feel like you've got more energy so get up go out and use it okay reason number three is a lack of fiber and very simply put a lack of fiber is going to mess up your digestive system and it's also going to stop you from going to the toilet and quite simply put if you are holding on to more fecal matter shall we say you are going to weigh more and honestly you would be amazed how many adults are walking around constipated and by the way being constipated can actually have a huge impact on your mood so if you're not going to the toilet for number two regularly look at your fiber intake reason number four is a big one and it is stress the two biggest factors that i often find are influencing my clients stress levels are how well they've slept and how many stimulants they're having. A lack of sleep, whether that's the quantity of sleep, how many hours per night you're sleeping, or the quality of your sleep, or the regularity of your sleep, coupled with over-consuming stimulants, causes a rise in cortisol, which is your stress hormone. Your brain raises your cortisol as a defense mechanism. It senses that you are under attack. Now, it doesn't understand what you are under attack from. In fact, our prehistoric brains probably think we're being chased by saber-toothed tigers. The reality is in the modern world, we're probably stressing over something that we've seen on social media or that our boss has said to us or our partners wound us up. We're very lucky in this day and age, the vast majority of us, that we don't actually have anything life and death to be stressing over. We don't really have to worry about where our next meal's coming from. We have access to fresh water, electricity, heating, roofs over our head and all of this nice luxuries that we now take for granted. But our brains don't know that. So it elevates your cortisol level to make your body more efficient. It enables your muscles to contract faster. It heightens your senses. But what it also does is it encourages your body to hold on to water weight because it doesn't know when you're next going to get water. Remember, this is a defensive mechanism. So if the scales aren't coming down, it might be because you're chronically stressed. And like I say, the two biggest factors that tend to influence people's stress the most is how well they've slept, and how many stimulants they're having. So try to limit your caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and sugar, and try to make sure that you're getting at least seven hours of high quality sleep per night, and going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time. I've done another video all about sleep, so I'll let you go and find that if you wanna learn more about how to improve your sleep quality. I'm gonna knock off reason number five and reason number six together, and that is when you last ate, and what you last ate. When you last ate is going to influence your body weight because it takes time for your body to digest that food. So if you've eaten a big meal at 8 or 9 p.m. and then are weighing yourself at 7 a.m. the next morning, you are still going to be holding on to that food. Yes, your body has digested the vast majority of it, but a lot of it will now be sitting as waste product. And what you last ate ties in with what we talked about earlier with the carbohydrates. If you've had a high carbohydrate meal, that's gonna impact the weight you see on the scales. And then reason number seven is when you last went to the toilet, both for number one and for number two. Both urine and fecal matter are going to contribute to your body weight. So like I said earlier, if you find that you're constipated or you're not going to the toilet regularly, that is going to have an effect on your body weight. Number eight is how hydrated you are. And this again is a big one. The percentage fluctuates, but give or take, we are walking around made up of about 70% water. So your body weight, is gonna be largely affected by your water weight. And your water weight is going to be largely affected by how hydrated you are. The craziest part is, is that not drinking enough water can actually lead to increased water retention and can prevent you from losing weight. And again, this is a defense response from your body. If it starts to sense that you're getting even one or 2% dehydrated, it's going to make everything more efficient and it's going to encourage those cells to hold on to more water. Because it knows if you get too dehydrated, quite literally, you're going to die. So if you want to see the scales come down, and here's another incentive for you to drink more water, you want to stay well hydrated. Number nine is medical conditions. And there's two that I want to talk about in particular, hypothyroidism and PCOS. Hypothyroidism is known to slow down your metabolism. And PCOS in women, polycystic ovary syndrome, is also known to create hormone imbalances. And both of these factors can influence your body weight and the rate of change that you're going to see on the scales. And then linked to that, number 10 is medication. Some medications such as antidepressants, antipsychotics, and corticosteroids can actually cause weight gain and make weight loss much more difficult. Number 11 is your gut health. If your gut microbiome is imbalanced, your gut health is likely to be poor. And when your gut health is poor, your gut is probably going to be inflamed. This means your gut is going to be worse at absorbing nutrients into the bloodstream, and it's going to contribute to poor digestive health. And both of those things can make losing weight a lot more difficult. You can fix this very simply by increasing the amount of fiber, 
and introducing prebiotics into your diet. Looking after your gut health is also gonna have a positive impact on your mental health. And that's because neuroscientists have found that 90 to 95% of your serotonin, which is your feel good, happy hormone, is actually produced in your gut. So the healthier and happier your gut is, the healthier and happier your brain is gonna be. So that's an added incentive for you to do this. Number 12 and number 13 are specifically for the ladies out there. Hormonal changes during your menstrual cycle can lead to temporary weight gain. You might not need me to break this down for you, and I'm sorry if you think I'm mansplaining, but it's absolutely staggering in 2024 how little education women are getting around their menstrual cycle and the impact that it can have on their health and their weight. But yeah, the hormonal changes during the cycle are going to impact your weight, and they're also gonna impact your cravings. It's very natural, it's very normal, so don't worry too much about it. And then number 13 is menopause. So the hormonal changes during menopause can actually slow down your metabolism and alter how the fat is distributed in your body. Number 14 is alcohol consumption. Because we drink alcohol rather than eating it, a lot of people don't associate it with calories. But alcohol is calorie dense, and as a result, it can push you out of that calorie deficit. What it also does, I'm sure you know, is it lowers your inhibitions, which can then lead to overeating. Number 15 is your sodium intake, how much salt you've got in your diet. High sodium intake can lead to water retention and bloating leading to temporary weight gain. But I wanna make it very clear that having high sodium in your diet is not necessarily a bad thing. Number 16 is digestive disorders, particularly IBS. Obviously this can affect your digestion, but it can also affect the amount of nutrients that your body is able to absorb from the food that you're eating. It's obviously gonna be closely related to your gut health, and we talked about that earlier. Number 17 is the temperature. Spending time or even living in an environment that our body isn't used to, that's either too hot or too cold, it's going to affect your metabolism and the amount of energy that you're expending. You'll often find that if you're in a hot country, you'll feel very lethargic. It also takes a few days for your body to catch up drinking enough water so that you're not dehydrated. And if you're dehydrated, that's also going to make you feel lethargic. If you're lethargic, you're going to be moving less. If you're moving less, you're lowering your maintenance calories. And as a result, you're knocking yourself out of that calorie deficit. If you go from one climate to another, your brain is also going to sense that and it could lead to a temporary increase in the amount of water that it retains. Number 18 is food allergies and sensitivities. A lot of people have undiagnosed food allergies and sensitivities and so as a result of that, they are continuously eating food that is inflaming their gut and leading to temporary weight gain or preventing their weight loss from occurring. Number 19 is endocrine disruptors. Now your endocrine system is responsible for your hormonal health and exposure to chemicals in plastics and pesticides can disrupt hormone function and as a result, your metabolism. Last but not least, number 20, and it's a big one, body composition changes. If you've created a calorie deficit and are starting to go to the gym, you're going to be losing fat but building muscle. Over an extended period of time, that's gonna have a very positive, but also potentially a very radical effect on your body composition. And what I mean by body composition is, you know, how you look. So you might look a lot better, but your weight hasn't changed that much. And that's probably because you've lost a lot of body fat, but also gained a lot of muscle. There's a common misconception that muscle weighs more than fat, but one kilo of muscle versus one kilo of fat is still one kilo. So they weigh the same, but what you find is that muscle is far denser than fat. It occupies a smaller space. So you could lose a radical amount of fat and gain a little bit of muscle, but not see that much change in your body weight. Ultimately, that's a good thing. Losing excess body fat is great for your health, as is building muscle. So that's the 20 reasons why you might not be losing weight, even if you feel like you're doing everything right. But before we get into the solutions, I want to rank these quickly, because what I don't want is people to over-obsess over the ones that aren't really gonna move the needle that much. The most important one, without a shadow of a doubt, has to be making sure that you're in a calorie deficit. The next most important one I would say is how hydrated you are. As I said, at any given point, you're walking around made up of about 70% water. So how hydrated you are is gonna have such a big impact on your overall body weight. The next most important factor has to be how stressed you are. I recently experienced this myself. I went through a couple of weeks where I was extremely stressed and I was holding on to more water weight. And then I caught myself in the mirror the other day and I had literally lost probably one or two kilos of excess water weight. This is a big one, it's not spoken about enough. I appreciate managing your stress can be very difficult, but if you implement some basic daily habits, actions and behaviors, you can get on top of this pretty quickly. The fourth most important factor is the quality of the food that you're eating and the effect that's gonna have on your gut health. Even if you're in a calorie deficit, if you're constantly eating junk food and processed food, you are gonna be walking around with an inflamed gut 24 seven. And whilst you might be losing body fat, you are not gonna lose much weight. And of course, the other big factor, even though it's one that only affects half of the population, is the menstrual cycle. So what's the solution, guys? Well, step number one, make sure that you're in a calorie deficit. Recalculate what your maintenance calories are, and then put yourself in a sustainable deficit, and then stick to that deficit 
for an extended period of time. The next step in the solution is to make sure that you've got a big reason for why you're doing this. You want your why to be a deep intrinsic driver. You don't want to be driven by some kind of external validation or some sort of short-term goal like wanting to get abs for the Ibiza trip with the boys. Step three in the solution is to sit down on a Sunday night and to plan out each week. Plan out your low calorie days and plan out your high calorie days. Allow yourself some freedom and give yourself back some control. If you feel like you have to be so regimented and stick to a specific calorie number every single day, you're probably going to fail. So what I would do is calculate your maintenance calories, minus 500, that's gonna give you your daily recommended calorie intake to hit your fat loss goals, and then multiply that number by seven. That's gonna give you a weekly calorie allowance. And then on a Sunday night, sit down and figure out which days you're gonna have lower calorie days, on which days you're going to allow yourself to have higher calorie days. As I said, this is so important because it makes it so much more sustainable. Give yourself so much more freedom, so much more control, and it makes it like you're doing all of this on easy mode. And then linked to that, step number four is to build in a sustainable movement plan, making sure that you're trying to go for a walk every single day and getting in some exercise three to four times a week with a nice mix of cardio and resistance training. And then step number five is to clean up your environment. Put it this way, if your friend came to you and said that they were an alcoholic, what's the first thing you would tell them to do flush all the booze down the sink well similarly we need to remove anything that's tempting you to over consume your calories anything that's making this harder for you so just throw all that junk out we also want to clean up your sleep environment making sure your room is dark making sure it's cold making sure you're sleeping with a window or a door open wearing earplugs so you're not disturbed throughout the night having a high quality mattress and bedding all of these things might seem like an upfront cost but they are such a good long-term investment. If you can improve your sleep quality from let's say 70% to 90%, that's gonna pay back very quickly. You're gonna have more energy, more drive. All of this is gonna seem much easier. You're gonna be more productive. You're gonna have better relationships. You're probably gonna get promoted at work. You're gonna earn more money and just life is gonna get a lot better. And then execute on all of that and be consistent with it. But more importantly than that, be patient. One of the most important lessons that I teach my clients is that your trajectory is far more important than your current position or the speed that you're going at towards your destination. If you're going in the right direction, if you're on the right path, if you're working towards your goals, it doesn't matter where you are or how fast you're getting there because you're doing it. You're doing everything right. You're seeing progress. It might be slow, it might be painful, but you are getting there. And if you're doing that, all you need to do is be patient and consistent. And having a strong why, a strong reason as to why you're all doing this, makes that a lot easier, as does cleaning up your environment and making a plan each week. What I'd also encourage you to do is look into other ways of measuring your progress rather than just the scales. Take regular progress photos. This is such a game changer for my clients. They do a weekly check-in with me where I encourage them to take one or two progress photos. And then what I can do after one or two months, if they're feeling a little bit disheartened or discouraged, I can put their first photo next to their most recent photo. And it shocks them more often than not. They don't realize how much they've changed because when you're looking at yourself in the mirror every single day, you're not going to notice that change. But if you externalize that through a photo and you look at that week one photo versus the week eight or week 12 photo, you're going to see substantial changes as long as you're doing the right things. You also want to look at how your clothes are fitting and what other people are saying about you. If you've been getting compliments from other people that you look like you're losing weight or your face is changing shape, you're on the right trajectory. You're on the right path. The other thing I'd encourage you to do is to get scales that measure your body fat percentage. Now, the actual number itself might not be that accurate because all these scales are doing is shooting a very small electric current through your body, and they're using that to measure the difference between water weight and fat weight. And they can do that because water conducts electricity and fat doesn't. Like I say, these scales aren't particularly accurate, but what you can do over time is look at the trajectory of the numbers. So if you did this on day one of week one versus day seven of week four, and you saw the number go from 20% body fat to 18 or 17% body fat, you know that you are going in the right direction. Again, we're trying to see if you're on the right trajectory. And last but not least, guys, remember, your weight is not tattooed on your forehead, and no one cares. Everyone else is so caught up in their own lives, in their own stresses, and their own problems. Please don't attach your weight to your self-worth. If you are trying, and by watching this video, I can assume that you are, you have my respect. And you should respect yourself for trying. Your weight is your gravitational pull to this planet. And that is it. In space, you weigh nothing. So I appreciate that when you're motivated, when you're trying, when you feel like you're doing everything and the scales aren't moving or they're not moving as fast as you want them to, how frustrating it can be. But hopefully this video has shown you that there are so many things that impact your body weight. And hopefully you've understood the difference between your body fat 
and your body weight. Anyway, I'll leave this video here. Comment below and let me know which of the reasons out of those 20 you think is holding you back from losing weight the most. I'd love to hear that from you. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to smash the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.